Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to phyloseminar.org, a project supported by the Society of Systematic Biologists. We are wrapping up a session of three talks about genetic approaches to genetic conservation. The first talk was from Arna Moores, and then we had Catherine Graham, and today we have Sandrine Pavuan. I'm grateful to Arne for helping organize this team session. As I mentioned, today we have a talk from Sandrine Pavuan. Sandrine works in mathematical ecology and is particularly interested in measures of species, functional and phylogenetic diversity, and their applications to conservation and community ecology. Sandrine has her PhD in statistical ecology from the University of Lyon, where she was supervised by Daniel Chesnel. She was then a Mary Curie Fellow working on mathematical ecology at Oxford. Uh, she is now an associate professor at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris and a research associate at the Oxford Department of Zoology. Welcome, Sandrine, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So welcome to everyone on this internet presentation. As Eric Marston said, my name is Sandrine Pavoine and I intend to speak about phylogenetic and trait diversity. The presentation is going to last approximately 45 minutes and then I will be happy to answer your questions. Above all, I would like to thank Eric Marston and Arnie Moes for having invited me to give this talk. Apart from uh, the introduction and conclusion, my presentation will be divided in three parts. First, I will rapidly review trait-based and phylogeny-based diversity indices. Next, I will look at the potential existence of a correlation between phylogenetic diversity and trait diversity. And then I will describe a possible approach to link traits and environment in a phylogenetic and spatial context. Overall, my presentation is based on community ecology, but from it, we will find applications to conservation biology. So previous presentations by Arnie Morris and Catherine Graham have mainly dealt with phylogenetic diversity. Here I add functional diversity, which is the diversity in functional traits. So I will first dis define the concept of trait and the concept of functional trait. I looked up for a kind of consensual definition for a trait on the internet and in scientific papers. And actually, I found several definitions and among others, uh, the following definitions. According to Wikipedia, a phenotypic trait or simply trait is a distinct variant of a phenotypic characteristic of an organism that may be inherited, be environmentally determined or be a combination of the two. In Science Daily, one can read that in biology, a trait or a character is a feature of an organism, which is a very broad definition, but it was given in opposition to a phenotype, which is the attribute of a trait like uh, blue for the trait eye color. In uh, McGill and collaborators at 2006, a trait is a well-defined measurable property of organisms uh, usually measured at the individual level and used comparatively across species. The concept of functional trait has been defined to denote a particular type of trait. So, um, according to McGill and colleagues, a functional trait is one that strongly influences organismal performance. More precisely, Viol and colleagues provided this definition of plant functional trait. Functional traits are defined as morphophysiophenological traits which impact fitness indirectly via their effects on growth, reproduction and survival, the, th the three components of individual performance. In the same vein, Ware and colleagues defined functional traits as traits that are associated with species' ability to gain resources, disperse, reproduce, respond to loss, and generally persist. In parallel to these definitions, a trait is also often considered to be functional as regards a certain ecosystem process or as regards its response to environmental variations, 
using empirical approaches either through observations or through experimentations. Referring to a paper by Lavorel and Garnier, Hooper and colleagues defined uh, functional traits as those that influence ecosystem properties or species responses to environmental conditions. So functional diversity is uh, those the diversity in species functional traits, while more generally trait or trait-based diversity is the diversity in species traits. In ecology, functional diversity is mostly studied to disentangle the processes that structure species assemblages, including competition, dispersion, and environmental filtering. Environmental filtering assuming a biotic forces act on uh, act to constrain uh, certain trains, traits within limits. Um, patterns in functional diversity in space are interpreted in reference to those processes. For instance, when species that coexist have similar functional traits, they are said to be functionally clustered, a pattern often interpreted as an evidence for environmental filters. Inversely, when species that coexist have different functional traits, they are said to be functionally overdispersed, a pattern often interpreted as an evidence for competition. In conservation biology, species traits are less often considered than species phylogenies. I think uh, there is an agreement on the fact that we should try to protect variety, a diversity of traits and phenotypes. But why we should focus on traits that are said functional is less clear. It may be that we are trying to save processes that underlie species diversity at all scales. However, despite the fact that some studies were carried out to evaluate whether functional diversity is high in protected areas, in general it was made without reference to processes underlying the functional diversity. Another point about functional diversity is that research on functional diversity is strongly biased towards certain taxa and above all towards plants. Here is a Google Scholar search with functional diversity as a first keyword and a taxonomic group as a second keyword. What we can see here is that the number of results is indeed strongly biased towards plants. Another important thing is that adding phylogenetic diversity as a third keyword, the number of, the number of results strongly decreases for all taxa considered. Then adding conservation biology, we lose, for instance, for plants, more than 99% of the results. So, considering both functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity, especially in conservation biology, is still quite new. More generally, uh, the lack of consideration of functional and phylogenetic diversity in conservation biology is probably primarily due to difficulties in estimating phylogenies and obtaining trade values at large taxonomic and geographic scales. When one has to select traits for a given study, choice may be driven by knowledge and the taxa under study and by knowledge of the ecological processes under study. All choice may be driven by the databases and species traits that have already been compiled. And among those databases, uh, the traits with the lowest amount of missing data may be selected. So the selection of traits for a given study may be quite difficult, as is the measurement of trait values for species, especially at large scales. A proposed solution to the problem of obtaining values for traits and of selecting appropriate traits uh, is to use phylogenetic distances among species as proxies for functional trait differences. This may be possible for traits that have phylogenetic signals. By this we mean that 
phylogenetically close species tend to share similar trait values, while distantly related species tend to have different trait values. But does it work? And th the strengths of the phylogenetic signal may depend on scales. Empirical studies tend to show that uh, in it increases with taxonomic and spatial levels. So let's start now with the first part of this presentation, which is about trait-based and phylogeny-based diversity indices. Critical questions when analyzing diversity are, which measure of diversity should we use and why? All measures uh, start with the following basic data. So the presence or absence of uh, species in one of several sites. The choice of a measure may depend on the type of data used to characterize species. Trees with species as tips or dissimilarities among species. In ecology, phylogenetic data are typically considered in the form of a um, rooted tree with, tips as, with species as tips and internal nodes as ancestors. From a phylogenetic tree, we can calculate a pairwise phylogenetic distances between species using, for example, the sum of branch lengths in the smallest path uh, that connect uh, two species in the tree. These phylogenetic distances, rather than the tree itself, can be used as parameters in diversity indices. Functional trait data are often transformed directly into a matrix of pairwise functional dissimilarities between species. So let's consider that we start with a matrix of pairwise dissimilarities between species. The definition of a matrix of dissimilarity is simply that it contains zeros on the diagonal, so the dissimilarity between a species and itself is zero. Values are um, um, positive um, outside of the diagonal and the matrix is uh, symmetrical so that the dissimilarity between a species i and the species j is equal to the dissimilarity between j and i. Some diversity indices start with the matrix of pairwise dissimilarities between species and measure some statistics on the matrix such as the mean or the variance of the dissimilarities. Examples are uh, the sum of pairwise dissimilarities, the sum of pairwise dissimilarities divided by the number of species, uh, the mean of pairwise dissimilarities, here excluding the dissimilarity between a species and itself, um, the weighted mean of pairwise dissimilarities, uh, which here includes uh, the dissimilarity between a species and itself, and also use abundance data to weight species. This latter index here uh, was named quadratic entropy by Rao. Starting with the matrix of dissimilarities among species, some indices represent species as points in a Euclidean space, so that the distance between two points is the dissimilarity of interest. For this equality between the distances among points and the phylogenetic or trait-based dissimilarities of interest to be true, the dissimilarities must have some mathematical properties named Euclidean properties. Another alternative that was used in the literature to obtain this uh, functional space was to start with a space directly, directly defined by quantitative traits where each axis is a quantitative trait. The distance between two species points in that case simply corresponds to the Euclidean distance in their trait states. Several diversity indices describe, uh, then describe structures in the clouds of points, such as uh, volumes or point uh, dispersion. 
Some indices, including Rouse quadratic entropy, can be defined both in terms of dissimilarities among species and in terms of dispersion of points in Euclidean space. But this is not always the case. Other diversity indices start with trees, mostly wooded trees, with species as tips. So for phylogenetic diversity, they start with the phylogenetic tree. For functional diversity, they transform a matrix of pairwise functional dissimilarities among species into functional, a functional tree using clustering approaches. So once we have the tree, uh, these indices measure diversity by analyzing some parameters on the tree, like uh, the balance of the tree, um, and I will hereafter rename tree size at the diversity index defined as, as the sum of branch lengths of a tree, whatever the type of the tree. So be it a functional or a phylogenetic tree. So what we can see is that um, diversity indices are themselves diverse. By this, I mean that there is a myriad of different ways of measuring functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity. Sometimes uh, the mathematical differences between two indices are subtle, but as we will see in the next part, even subtle differences can modify the interpretation of patterns of biodiversity. For example, uh, using the sum or the mean of the dissimilarities among species may strongly change our point of view on biodiversity and those it can have consequences um, when one or the other index is used for prioritizing conservation actions. So with this very rapid review of how to measure diversity in ecology, we can try to answer the questions. Um, are phylogenetic and trait-based diversity correlated and why? So phylogenetic and trait-based diversity patterns may be different, even if traits have strong phylogenetic signal because of the use of different diversity indices. Indeed, if the mathematics of the indices are different, it may mean that we are looking at different aspects of diversity. So the first point is to use similar indices for both functional and phylogenetic diversity when the aim is to compare these aspects of biodiversity. This graph here shows correlations between phylogenetic and functional diversity obtained in a plant case study of 75 plant communities. So we have phylogenetic diversity um, measured on the y uh, axis and here um, sorry on the x axis and here on the y axis we have um, functional diversity and the different names here give different names of uh, diversity indices the diagonal of the matrix and the blue line represents correlation obtained using the same index for measuring both functional and phylogenetic diversity. We can see that all the values outside of the diagonal are correlations obtained using distinct indices to measure functional and phylogenetic diversity. Closed square or black squares are for positive correlation and white or open squares for negative correlations. Therefore, we can conclude that the use of distinct indices may either exaggerate or inversely underestimate uh, the true link between the phylogenetic and the functional aspects of diversity. With certain indices here, the correlations are always high. This is because these indices are all correlated with species richness the number of species. So um, a second point is that phylogenetic and trait-based diversity patterns may be similar because of confounding factors, 
namely uh, the species richness and the evenness of species abundance. This means that an observed correlation between phylogenetic and functional diversity does not imply that there is a phylogenetic signal in functional traits. By this I mean, if you remember, that two phylogenetically close species do not necessarily share similar trait values, while distantly related species do not necessarily have different trait values. Given the real data set with observed abundances for plant species in 75 sites and an associated phylogenetic tree, we simulated traits with various levels of phylogenetic signal using a Brownian model, a Blombergian collaborators AC, so accelerating model, and uh, simply using a Gaussian uh, a normal law. We calculated phylogenetic and functional diversity per site per site, using several diversity indices. And we calculated Spearman rank correlation between phylogenetic and functional diversity. We obtained various uh, correlations between phylogenetic and functional diversity. So given the graph here, um, the level of correlation depended on the diversity index used and on the phylogenetic signal in traits. So the black uh, bar here represents Bonian model, and um, the gray bars are for decreasing phylogenetic signal, and the white bar is for the simply the Gaussian uh, distribution. So here we can see that high correlations were always found um, between phylogenetic and functional diversity with indices that were correlated with species richness, even when, tr when traits were simulated according to a Gaussian distribution, so independently of the phylogeny. To remove the effect of confounding factors, the first solution is to use indices that do not depend on species richness and abundance evenness. For example, Rouse quadratic entropy index uh, is uh, the average um, dissimilarity among species weighted by their abundance. In its formula, pi is the relative abundance of species i, and dij is the dissimilarity between species i and j, either phylogenetic or functional dissimilarity. According to Shimatani, uh, this index can be decomposed into simpler indices here named mean D, G, and B. Mean D is the average dissimilarity between distinct species without considering species abundance. Um, G is the Simpson index. It is a probability when randomly sampling two individuals from a species assemblage of selecting two individuals from different species. It depends on species richness, S here, and on the evenness in species um, abundance. B is a coefficient that can be related to a covariance between species abundance and uh, the similarity between species. In our simulations, using uh, the quadratic entropy, the correlations between functional and phylogenetic diversity were always medium, around 0.5. The quadratic entropy depends on species richness when assemblages have low species uh, richness, which was often the case in our case study, as we consider sites having from 5 to 15 species. Whatever the level of species richness, this index, the quadratic entropy, depends on the evenness in species abundance. So it depends on factors that can be considered as confounding factors when comparing phylogenetic diversity with functional diversity. In contrast, uh, for its components B and mean D, the value of the correlation as expected tends towards zero in absence of uh, phylogenetic uh, signal in functional traits. Another uh, solution to control confounding factors is to use null models uh, that control for species richness and species abundance. To do that, for a given diversity index, 
we calculate the observed diversity value. Next, we choose a null model and apply it. For instance, by randomizing species among the tips of the phylogeny or randomizing trait states among the species. We do, we do that, say, 1,000 times. For each simulation, we calculate the theoretical diversity value. And once it is done, then we calculate a standardized effect size, SES, as uh, the observed value minus the mean of theoretical values divided by the standard deviation of theoretical values. This standardized effect size is used as a new index of diversity uh, considered to be independent of uh, species richness and evenness in species abundance. For example, con consider that the diversity index that I simply named tree size for this presentation is uh, the sum of all branch lengths on a tree, be it a phylogenetic tree, as in the framework developed by FACE, or a functional tree, as in the framework developed by Pitchy and Gaston. Even if with this index, in certain circumstances, one can obtain higher diversity with less a species separated by long branches than many species separated by tiny branches. Generally speaking, this index is influenced by species richness. In our simulations, we obtained high correlations between phylogenetic and functional diversity using the tree size, but lower correlations when using the SES transformation. So the standardized effect size. In particular, we obtained close to zero correlations in absence of phylogenetic signaling trait. On the other hand, phylogenetic and trait-based diversity patterns may be similar, not because of, of confounding factors, but because traits have linear phylogenetic signal so that phylogenetic distances truly reflect trait-based distances among species. To check this, one has to test for phylogenetic signaling traits. However, in our simulations, we can see that even when traits have a phylogenetic signal, for instance, being simulated according to a Brownian model, so looking at the black bars here, Functional and phylogenetic diversity patterns may be different, so we obtained uh, moderate to low correlations here. So a question for further research is how strong must the phylogenetic signal be in order to ensure a link, that is to say high correlation between functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity? The recent literature now accumulates examples at local scales where functional traits have significant phylogenetic signal. But although functional diversity is structured in space, phylogenetic diversity appears to be randomly distributed. Finally, phylogenetic and trait-based diversity patterns may be different because traits are convergent and phylogeny reflects historical processes why traits reflect more recent evolution, for instance, driven by adaptation to the environment. We will see an example of this in the next and last part. So in the last part, I will talk about the links between uh, traits and environmental variables in a phylogenetic and spatial context. I will take this example to show how the analysis of traits can be done with regards to the phylogeny instead of replacing traits by phylogenetic information. The basic data for this approach are a matrix that gives the abundance of presence absence of species in sites. Then sites are described in terms of environmental variables and spatial variables while species are described in terms of functional traits and phylogeny. All matrices are analyzed using ordination approaches. For matrix E of environmental variables, we can use um, different ordination 
analysis. It can be analyzed using, for, for instance, principal component analysis if the variables are quantitative. If they are of multiple types, such as a mix of nominal, quantitative, or ordinal variables, uh, then distances among sites can first be obtained using, for instance, Gower distance coefficient or one of its generalization. Um, that also allows for the presence of missing data in the variables. If the resulting dissimilarity matrix has Euclidean properties, then it can be analyzed directly via principal coordinate analysis. If not, it can be transformed using, for, in, for example, Lindgren's approach before applying principal coordinate analysis. Alternatives are possible, such as using non-metric multidimensional scaling. So whatever the, the ordination method used, all these alternative approaches and with a system of coordinates uh, for sites in a Euclidean, in a multivariate Euclidean space. So we have points in a Euclidean uh, space that represent the sites. And um, we can define the coordinates of the sites in this space. I named uh, this matrix with sites as rows and coordinates along axes as columns, uh, XE. Now, we need a matrix uh, that describes the spatial organization of sites. Here again, several solutions are possible. One of them is to define a binary uh, matrix of neighborhood. In this matrix, zero means that the two sites compared are not neighbors, and one that they are. Here we have the map of the area, and there each segment is linking uh, two neighboring sites. Once uh, this matrix has been obtained, we can use an eigenvalue decomposition to obtain a matrix of coordinates for sites in a Euclidean space. So this matrix named XS describes the spatial coordinates of the sites. The analysis of species traits can be done um, in just the same manner as the analysis of environmental variables. So the steps are the same as for the environment, and we come up with the matrix XT, giving coordinates for species along axes in a functional space. Finally, the analysis of the phylogeny may be done by, for, for example, by a principal coordinate analysis of a matrix of pairwise phylogenetic distances among species, leading to a matrix XP of species coordinates in a phylogenetic space. So here we obtain a space where each point is a species, and we can define the coordinates of, the, of all species in the space. So, we have defined a matrix of coordinates for sites um, driven by the environmental variables, one for also for sites driven by the spatial variables or spatial organization. Uh, we have a matrix of coordinates uh, for species driven by the traits and one driven by the phylogeny. So the next step is to juxtapose uh, the matrices XE and XS for the sites into a single matrix with sites as rows and systems of coordinates along axes in columns. We can just juxtapose the matrices, but uh, to avoid giving too much importance to one of the matrix, a solution is to divide XE by the first eigenvalue associated with the ordination approach that generated it. Uh, the, resulting, the new resulting matrix being named XE star and similarly, to divide XS by the first eigenvalue associated with the eigenvalue decomposition that generated it, uh, the new resulting matrix being named XS star. The same approach is used with uh, species traits and phylogeny. 
This method used to combine environmental and spatial data and to combine trait and phylogenetic data follows a multiple factorial analysis adapted to deal with uh, the different types of statistical variables we have here, or merely uh, the different types of data. Then we end with three matrices. L, for the abundance, for species abundances or presence absence in sites, the juxtaposed um, spatial environment matrix for sites and the juxtaposed trait and phylogeny matrix for species. The last step combines these three matrices by an approach named RLQ, which maximizes uh, the covariance between the variables that characterize sites and the variables that characterize species. This approach renders apparent um, coordinates for sites that are linear combinations of species characteristics and coordinates for, um, for species um, that are linear combinations of species, sorry, coordinates for species that are linear combinations of species characteristics and coordinates for sites that are linear combinations of sites characteristics, so as to maximize the covariance between uh, the coordinates for species and the coordinates for sites. To calculate this covariance, standardized version, a standardized version of uh, matrix L serves as a linking matrix between the two systems of coordinates. And then, as with a classical ordination approach, we end with axes for species, so global axes for species, and axes for sites, which describe independent associations between species characteristics and site characteristics. The coordinates attributed to species on these axes will be compared with those attributed to sites to reveal associations between species traits and phylogeny and the spatial and environmental organizations of sites. So let's take an example. We analyzed the plain data set which uh, Gérard de Beller collected in Algeria in a place named La Mafrag, which refers here to a coastal plain also named Mekada in the east of Anama. It is bounded by dunes here with a narrow connection um, with the Mediterranean Sea in the north, by Numidian clay sandstone mountains in the south, um, by a river in the east, and by an, agric uh, by an irrigated agricultural zone in the west. It is located in a subhumid bioclimate with warm winters. Uh, plant abundance data were collected in 97 sites evenly distributed in the area. Trade values were collected from the literature uh, by Sophie Gachet, Erol Vela and uh, colleagues. We considered four traits for this analysis, uh, life cycle, pollination mode, the presence of spiky structures and the presence of hairy leaves. Spiky structures and hairy leaves are structures uh, that improve plant resistance to the dry hot season. They facilitate water retention and reflect solar radiation. Environmental variables were related to the soil composition in clay, lime and sand, with salinity and with elevation, ranging from 1 to 4 meters above sea level for the majority of the area. The phylogeny was obtained using the phylomatic database and different sources to estimate the age of uh, interior, internal nodes. So we applied the extended RLQ approach to this data set. I give results here only for the first axis of the ordination approach. This axis expresses 65% of the covariance between um, species characteristics and site characteristics, starting with the so, starting with the coordinates of the species, um, we, cal we calculated correlations between species traits and the first axis, and we plotted species coordinates in front of the phylogeny. Then for sites, uh, we plotted the coordinates of the sites in the map of the study area, with the seal in the north here. A square represents a, a site, a black square is used for a positive coordinate and a white one for a negative coordinate. Uh, 
From these coordinates, we calculated correlations between the environmental variables and the first axis of the RL2 here. The global coordinates of the sites can be additively decomposed into a component driven by the environment and a component driven by the geographical space. Similarly, the global coordinates of the species can be additively decomposed into a component driven by the traits and a component driven by the phylogeny. These graphs can be interpreted as follows. Species are distributed from a negative to positive coordinates along a salinity gradient, which partly corresponds to an elevation gradient with the lowest elevations having the highest salinity. Exceptions are certain monocot Mediterranean species with close to zero coordinates that are dominant in abundance all over the study area during the rainy season when soils which in clay retain water. On the negative side of the axis, in areas with a low salinity, high elevation, and on soil richer in sand, decot Mediterranean species that are seasonal, annual or biennial, entomogamous uh, or autogamous, end their cycle before the hot season. Lots of them have, have airy leaves uh, that facilitate water retention and reflection of sun rays. They are located on the east and west parts of the plain. On the positive side of the axis, sorry, yeah, in areas with high salinity, there is evidence for trade conversions here between the monocot Juncaceae and Cyperaceae species that tolerate soils and the decant, decot Amaranthaceae species that are halophytes. Most of these species are perennial and um, anemogamous with sometimes spiky structures, um, but no hairy leaves. They are found in abundance in the central part of the area with two zones here A and B having the highest salinity level. The environment on which these species were found in this study area tend to look um, like their original environment uh, in tropical and subtropical areas. So with such an approach, we can describe precisely which clades are implied in environmental filters and describe these filters in terms of environmental characteristics and spatial distribution. A perspective for this approach would uh, be applications at larger spatial scales, especially for conservation biology, but for this we need trade data for many species. A recent paper took up this challenge. In conclusion, uh, the choice of an index of biodiversity may impact the interpretation of an analysis. Current conservation actions that target species richness do not always preserve phylogenetic diversity. But preserving phylogenetic diversity may be different than preserving, preserving trade diversity. And this may also depend on which and how many traits we are looking, we are looking for or talking about. If we are to conserve processes instead of lists of species, new analyses must integrate spatial, temporal and evolutionary scales in order to disentangle the mechanisms that drive species assembly. New analyses those must combine information on species traits with estimations of phylogeny. One part of the challenge is to identify important traits and the, and the clades uh, implied in a given process, as a given process may concern only part of a community. Other parts of the challenge are to improve phylogenetic estimations, uh, measure traits, and to consider intraspecific variation in ecology and conservation biology. 
So for this presentation, I would like to thank all my colleagues, uh, the co-authors, including Michael Bonsol, Sophie Gachet, Norman Mason, Carlo Ricotta, and uh, the many others uh, who contributed to this work. I thank all students and postdoctoral researchers and a particular thank to PhD students, former and current, Amandine Gask, Simon Verum, Victor Saito. Thank you for your attention. All right. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sandrine. That was a very interesting talk. Um, uh, let me remind everyone that we do uh, take questions. I've posted the uh, instructions for the Q&A app on Google Plus. Um, I'm, I'm actually just kind of curious, so if we think about sort of like a Noah's Ark type problem or, you know, pri like explicitly trying to prioritize species to conserve, uh, like you have this incredibly sophisticated framework for breaking down the trait diversity in lots of different ways. Um, how would we go about thinking about how to prioritize conservation using that framework? Um, I think that the the question may not be at the, the beginning a question um, of designing a mathematical framework, but of um, defining what we would like to save because uh, the, the idea for conservation biology of uh, selecting phylogenetic diversity was um, was to to save um, what um, Arnie Moers presented as uh, uh, option value, uh, an idea developed by Dan Face. So uh, preserving uh, fun uh, not not necessarily functional, but preserving traits. Um, as many traits as possible, and even traits that we don't know um, right now, that we don't know uh, now. Um, so this is a first point, but um, even in the recent paper by Dan Face, we can see that uh, um, if we preserve fire genetic diversity, we will not actually preserve all type of diversity, and especially um, the diversity of traits that have um, been convergent in during evolution, and uh, also the diversity within species, which which is not captured by these um, big phylogenies. Mm. Okay. Um, I mean, so, so I mean, I guess my takeaway is sort of like you you really do. There's no automatic uh, free lunch. You just need to think about what are the traits that you actually do want to preserve. I don't. Uh, I don't think this is automatic. No. Yeah. Um. So it's sort of interesting the the divergence um, between the functional and the trait diversity. Uh, sorry, the functional and the um, phylogenetic diversity, but. I would expect that if you were measuring lots and lots of traits and each one of them was evolving according to some sort of Brownian motion process, it would seem to me that one could prove that if you sort of did an aggregated functional uh, diversity analysis across a, a large number of traits, then that would give you back exactly the sort of phylogenetic diversity, right? Or am I thinking about that wrong? So this is true. If if the uh, if the traits have exactly the same um, have been simulated with exactly the same process, like uh, the Brownian model, and if you simulate uh, lots of traits, then you will um, you will increase uh, the the detection of the phylogenetic signal. But um, but we we do not expect that real traits um, have evolved that way. I mean that um, for real for real file, uh, for real phenotype, phenotypic traits, uh, we um, we expect that um, uh, they have evolved uh, in different uh, ways, and especially um, different ways 
uh, across different branches of the phylogeny. So here for the simulations, I use the same process of evolution in every part of the of the phylogeny. But I do not expect this is true for for real traits. But even if you have, I mean, I don't know, just to push it a little bit further, I mean, if you if you have sort of some simple distribution of trait rates and some, I think I'm probably being naive here, but it would seem like even if you had some sort of distribution of rates uh, and maybe those rates were changing in some slight way across the tree, then you would still be able to re to get back the phylogenetic diversity. I mean, it's just, I guess part of it is that I mean, when we measure traits, even if we do a re relatively good job of measuring traits, we're still going to be measuring a small fraction of the traits that are actually present on the organism. And maybe there are some traits that are important that we're missing. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess that would just to me argue more towards a phylogenetic perspective. But, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah, especially in the in real data set, uh, we often have um, a various range of phylogenetic signal from um, from very low to moderate to high um, phylogenetic signals. So, um, as the the assumption that we can use phylogenetic signal as a proxy for functional traits rely on the fact that we expect we we have a majority of of uh, traits with high phylogenetic signal, but when analyzing real data set, we especially at local scales, we realize that uh, this is not often the case. Yeah. I um. Yeah, would you mind going back to your slide, like the slide that showed your, I mean, I would say double principal, but is it a, considered now a tr triple, <laughs> triple factor, um, the, the results slide? This one? Can you see? Uh, not the setup, but the one of the application. Like this one? Um. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess um, oh, it's so beautiful. Uh, maybe we can just leave that up. I'll think about what I wanted to ask. And we'll, we'll give, Ar Arna has requested a slight pause so that you can type up this question. Um, he has a question. Uh, I'll stare at this, and, and we can just pause for just a sec if you don't mind. Yeah, I guess for my part, um, like if you, I guess the thing that seems sort of surprising to me is that the uh, is the distinction between that that's set up between the the trait based analysis and the phylogenetic based analysis. Like, um, so for instance, in some of these subclades, uh, was there a change of process, like? What I'm trying to say is that you have your phylogeny and then you simulate on it using some sort of, say, Brownian motion process. Um, but then when you go back and analyze the traits, you don't think about them as arriving via some sort of process on a tree, I guess, except for your factorization. Uh, yeah, this is true. Here I only describe patterns. Um in trade va variation uh, that are uh, that could be um, that could be related to the phylogeny, but um, I am not I am not using um, a model of evolution for the trait. So I'm so this is more descriptive descriptive statistics uh, than um, 
than trying to have mechanistic model. Right. I mean, I, I guess just staring at this, I sort of wonder if, like, um, you could infer some sort of change of, of process across the tree, uh, like some sort of uh, variety of motion with change points or something like that. But it doesn't, it's not sort of obvious to me that one would be able to do that looking at the projection of the trait based coordinates. They don't necessarily seem to, yeah, I guess it's hard to say. <laughs> OK, so we have a question from Arnit, which I'll read now. Uh, he says, hello, Dr. Pavlon. Uh, my question is a follow up from Eric's. Given that specific traits were measured on the plants in the Algerian data sets, why do we need the phylogeny and the three way dominant composition? So why do we need the phylogeny? So it's could so you repeat it? I'll just read it one more time. Given that specific traits were measured on the plants in the Algerian data set, mm -hmm. why do we need the phylogeny and the three-way decomposition? Um, we have traits for, for the data set, but uh, we don't have all of the, the traits that could ex explain the, the distribution of species along the the environmental gradient, especially we don't have um, physiological traits uh, because we couldn't uh, go to the field and measure those traits. So we simply used uh, traits obtained from the literature. Um, so um, the phylogeny may be used as um, um, also as a proxy for missing traits. Um, but it can also be used to to compare uh, the patterns we find in traits with the patterns uh, obtained in the phylogeny and uh, identify um, convergent evolution that is important um, that determines uh, the distribution of species along the across across the the field. So I think it provides more information than using only the, the traits. We can associate ecological processes with uh, historical processes by adding the phylogeny. Yeah. Is that clear? Um, yeah. I mean, it is, it's, it's definitely, it's a very advanced approach, I really. I really like it. Um, and he also says that your talk was a, a very clear and useful presentation. OK. Um, I think uh, we will wrap up here. Oh, OK, so one more question from Arna. Uh, if so, do the patterns support the prediction that a tree is a good proxy for missing traits in this particular example? Sorry? So Arna asks one more question. Uh, if so, uh, do the pattern support the prediction that the tree is a good proxy for missing traits in this particular example? He's asking uh, if, we, if we look at missing traits, I'm not sure if you have any such data, but if you have missing traits in this particular example, uh, do the patterns you see in the data support the prediction that the tree is a good proxy for those missing traits? Oh, no. I was referring to... Um, no, I cannot check that. Um, I cannot. It would be inst interesting if uh, if we had missing trade tra data for some species, but it was not the case. But I mean, say, say for instance that you were, uh, you know, part of the Edge of Existence program uh, that's using phylogenetic metrics. Is there something that, I mean, if you have just purely phylogenetic data, is there anything that you can kind of uh, do, like some modification of the phylogenetic? direction that you can do to 
improve it from the perspective of a trait-based analysis, or do you really need to go out and, and measure the trait? I think we need to measure traits. Um, the traits are already um, kind of proxy for species niches. Uh -huh. um, so I really think we need to go to the to to the traits and uh, um, and identify the traits that um, are involved in also identified mechanisms to uh, because. Um, if we consider phylogeny as a proxy, um, we will kind of try to guess a mechanism underlying the phylogenetic patterns, but um, we are mixing historical and ecological patterns in the phylogeny, and it's often hard to really um, disentangle these mechanisms uh, just having the phylogeny. Mm. Um, um, even measuring traits, uh, I think we have more information, but um, ideally, uh, we should also measure diversity within species. So the diversity of traits um, for different individuals of a species or, or for a of, for single individual, but at different time. Um, because for some taxa, we, we just uh, observe that um, diversity within species is um, sometimes very important and sometimes more important than for certain traits uh, than diversity among species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think we will wrap up there. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Uh, Arna continues, uh, so, but if the FD ordination, the functional diversity ordination and the phylogenetic diversity ordination were explaining the same variation in site presence absence, then we could say that the tree was a good pro proxy, no? Um, if I had the same patterns for the phylogeny and the traits, um, then yeah, I would say that, um, the traits I have identified um, are connected with the environment and space in the same way as uh, the fire genie. So we have, um, at least for the, the trade distances among the species that are interesting because they are linked with the environment and space, uh, we have a correlation with the fire genie, yes. Okay. Well, uh, that was a wonderful end to our uh, trio talks. So thank you very much, Sandrine, and thank you to Arna and Catherine as well. Uh, so the next session is going to be picking up in about a, uh, let's see, in December, hopefully. And uh, it's going to be about biased sampling. So. I will put up an announcement as soon as I can about that. All right. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you.